Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> My name is Mary Ann. I'm from Holly, Australia, and um, uh, we've been allowed to uh, to come in here thanks to our uh, our relationship with Andrea at Sun um, Miss Australia um, to run this session for people. It's a, an inaugural session for us. Um, we're using this as a jump off point for um, future sessions that we'd like to run, not particularly in Victoria, but in other states, with Holly Australia as a national organisation. <laughs> A um, couple of uh, housekeeping things first. Um, is there anybody here that um, has any objection to um, this session being filmed or for you having uh, your photo taken? Just where is it to be used? Which side do you want? It will be, it will be on <laughs> Polio Australia's website. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's all. That's yeah. fine. Um, thank you. If, if you do have any concerns, of course, it might not be... Um, you know, uh, you might not feel comfortable sort of saying anything in public, but please just come up to me and, and let me know that fine. Um, Andrea is uh, is the person who um, is the the person who knows all about this venue. Um, so, if you've got any any technical things, or if you need to know anything more about uh, NS Australia and the Nerve Centre, Andrea is a girl. Um, the uh, toilets are just, if you sort of like go past the cafe down the hall, um, and they're just uh, on your right down there, so that's where the loos are. Now, I just wanted to tell you um, a little bit oops, about uh, what we're going to run today. So, um, we've got Dr. Stanley Graff, uh, Senior Rehab Physician and Director of Pain Services at Equity Healthcare. Um, Steve will be going through um, the issues of diagnosing um, people with late piece of polio and post polio syndrome. Um, followed um, at 2.30 by Louise Thompson, um, who's a senior physiotherapist with neuromuscular orthotics and uh, uh, used to work for uh, pol um, Polio Services Victoria. Um, Natasha Layton um, is an occupational therapist and she's actually going to take us on a little tour of the Independent Living Centre after uh, our break, which will be at 3.10, which is like us. Um, and I'll finish up by um, telling you a little bit more about Polio Australia and uh, what services we can provide. Um, so the other thing that I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give all of you one of these which is the Late Bits of Polio Introduction to Clinical Practice book to take away. Um, you will also get a, um, an evaluation form from me. Um, and this is, once again, because this is an inaugural um, presentation, um, I'm, I'm very much going to value your feedback on the content of today. Um, so please, please um, take a moment to fill this out before you leave. I'll, ha I'll put them on the chairs sort of like at, at you know, afternoon tea break. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, ask Steve to carry on. Thanks, Mary Ann. Um, this is really useful because it has a lot of references. Um, and it's a really good uh, It's a bit more expensive than my talk, but I'll try to make my talk a little bit more, more anecdotal. Who's had exposure to polio survivors before? Okay. When you did your training at university or life, you were taught to do acute management. You were taught to to manage situations that arose all of a sudden. This group of patients are fascinating, and I love working with them, but we don't see a lot of them unless you're dedicated to the cause. But they are the classic chronic loss of function disability group who have adapted over the years. And the biggest complaint I have from this group is they're not listening to me. And that that's the whole spectrum. Because they've had to learn to adapt. Two things about them. Firstly, they're pig-headed. <laughs> Secondly, they're driven. Yeah. Yeah. And we get it mixed up. They're actually more driven than pig-headed. But what happens is, and I can say to you, 95 to 97% of the patients that I see, I win over. They're the pig-headed ones, that 3% of the ones that you're going to win because they know everything <laughs> beyond just their polio. But what, ha what you have to understand, the makeup of this person is someone who is, who is seriously ill, was left with functional deficits, adapted the world around them to cope. And that's how they function. And you have to listen to them when you manage them. That's, most of them know more about this than you and I. Mm -hmm. I'm forever learning when I talk to these guys. So 
What we're going to do is talk about, I, this is my pun, the legacy of Polo, because the commonest feature is the, the way to blow it in. But I'll just to give you some background and some management strategies, but Louise will do much more about that than I will. But um, just to give you some background of where we're at. When I was at university, too long ago now, a bit, um, we talked about the acute, the, the acute polio, and that was it. And it was all purely muscle, and that was it. And the medical fraternity to this day continue to think in that direction. Yeah. Even neurologists still do. We're working on some of our rehab trainees, and it's a better concept. So over time, that will improve. Unfortunately, as they improve, the number of polio survivors decreases. Yeah. But it's still, it's still, I think it's still a really good learning technique for um, those in the rehab field to understand about managing beyond the acute illness or injury. Uh, it's been around for longer than you and me, some of us feel quite ancient. Um, we know we've got evidence of it in uh, ancient Egypt and um, in Mesopotamia all those many, many years ago. The, the difference was, in that situation, was that people didn't survive. As, as rough as medicine was at the turn of the 19th century, and I remember seeing someone in Tasmania about 10 years ago who was 100, and she'd been, um, she'd been, uh, it was over 100, and she was involved with a, a polio outbreak in Tasmania at that time. We managed to cope with patients um, a lot better, polio survivors a lot better. But what, it wasn't really until Sharko, who was a neurologist, there's a, there's a disease process called Sharko's Shaco, joint, which is not related, but he noticed that polio survivors were getting weaker. Any of you managed spotting patients? Have any of you actually managed spinal patients? There's a similar trend here. There's spinal patients who have their spinal injury in younger, younger years. When they get down the track with they start dropping off a bit, running speed for reasons. Similar process. Because it's, it's about the amount of neuro, neuronal mass you've got that starts dropping off. But um, they're, they're a fascinating group. Oh, sorry. Who's this? You, you've seen the talk before, you know. I'm oh, wasn't you? Oh, good. Thank you. Who's that? Okay. Sorry. Very good. We're just smiling. No. Who is it? Roosevelt. Okay. If there was anyone that drove the management of polio survivors, it was Roosevelt. Why? And, and you know the story behind it? He was out, he'd been campaigning, had a two week break, he was campaigning for governor of New York, had a two week break, went up to his family family property up on the lakes, up in northern New York, rowed out, rowed out the boat with his two sons in the boat, became febrile, unable to move, they were stuck in the middle of the lake. They got him back in, then he ended up in a, a TV establishment, so a sign type set up. But it was from there on that he started pushing the March of Dimes, which principally was for polio survivors all those years ago, but now tends to be more for paediatric neurological conditions, per se. Aspects of this photo that are really important to notice. Arm on, hand on arm. Well, single stick stuck in the mud. And somewhere to land on if you go backwards. He always adapted himself. So if you ever... If you ever saw him, um, I suppose you're all too young, aren't you? None of you would have ever seen him. If you ever see photos of him when he was campaigning, he was never at the lectern. He was always at the back against the wall. Oh, no. He got out of bed at 11 o'clock in the morning, but he started work at 5 a.m. Did all this administrative stuff in bed, so he saved his physical energy. So he was a, he was a forward thinker in a way of managing himself. Um, which is unusual in a polio survivor because what they usually try to do is do everything at the start, at the start so they feel like they've completed things. But that's what you've got to break. So the other key thing about a polio survivor is in rehab, which is what most of us do, we try and reactivate people. This group we actually have to try and deactivate. So sometimes it's actually, you, you've got to change your thinking. But not only do you have to change your thinking, you have to change their thinking. And that can be quite challenging. 
So a number of epidemics in Australia. This is in Philadelphia. The, the key, the, there are two key things in this uh, photo. The first is you've got all your, your lung, lung tunes. And as you improved, you went to the, we didn't need the uh, uh, machines. The second thing is this guy is obviously a budding surgeon because he's got a bow tie on. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have multiple epidemics. Um, mass immunisation started in 1956 with the salt vaccine. Then you and all of us went through the Sabin vaccine, which is the uh, liquid form, on liquid form. Yeah. But in in the states of recent times, there's a child who developed polio after Sabin vaccination. Mm -hmm. So everyone has salt vaccine again. So that's the injection. The Sabin was a light attenuated virus, so there was potential for risk of infection. The risk is really remote, but the one case and the lawyers got involved. We still use safe vaccines in third world countries because oh. it's cheaper and really the safety profiles uh, not that bad and it actually is more accessible, so it still is used. Uh, can someone tell me what happened in 1953? I was born. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say 73, I said 53. <laughs> Who came, who came to Australia in 53? Lizzie and Phil the Greek came to Australia in 1953. The federal government and the New South Wales government were petrified of spreading polio. Absolutely petrified. It, it was a disease process that the world just didn't want to know about. One of the things they did, because Bessie and Phil wanted to shake hands with all the kids and meet all the kids, because we've got to keep the crown going. Depends if you're Republican or not. Um, but what they made all the kids do is wash their hands. And all of a sudden there was a major dip in the prevalence of polio. And that brought out the hand oral ingestion process. So all these hand techniques and all those things we talk about are really, really important in this. The problem with the third world countries is they struggle to be able to provide that sort of setup, and it's taken longer to eradicate. Last case of true polio in Australia, QF11, I think it was. And they had a, a student who had been from Pakistan and there was all the newspapers for a little, a little while. But what it highlighted was that, um, firstly, most people on the play were immunised, so we're likely to be having further spread. But secondly, this concept of not immunising children really is a risky concept. And this is a really good example of, you, you play with kids' lives. So that was a good example for us to get out there and say, listen, you've got to do something about this. This is not a joke. This can happen quite easily. Fortunately, I think, we're at eradication stage in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India now. Aren't we? It's mainly Africa. Not, not really. That's no, coming out. Pakistan's sort of like in, it's got some new cases. New cases, right. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> not well, a year ago it was reported that was the case, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Well, India. India is supposedly yeah. out. Yeah. Bangladesh is supposed to be free Yeah, I think Bangladesh is, but um, we've got Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nigeria, yeah. and then Nigeria's, we have other countries where we've been yeah. So Africa is really quite a struggle in that. All right, so this is a sticky little fella. He's on his book. <laughs> um, basically, what happens is it's orally ingested. There's at least three types, possibly up to five types. So if you've had polio, you still need to be vaccinated because it may not be the stream that we perfectly do. Um, it gets into the old oral cavity, then loves the lymphoid system, so involved with immunisation immunology. Most, most people are asymptomatic. Um, the commonest place it hits is the anterior horn cell, and probably 1-2% two, two at best end up with paralysis. But we also know that it's not just the anterior horn cell. We know with lower mid-brain, Brainstem are areas of targets as well. 
And that group can be an encephalitis type picture. It can be quite unwell. And the management is slightly different. <coughs> so, pons, midbrain, reticular formation. So, it's beyond the, the spinal cord, which is what I was taught. And often the patients who are most debilitated are those who have had encephalic component. Now there's still a lot of debate about can you have post-polio syndrome without paralysis. Mm -hmm. I tend to err on the side of caution and say no. Mm -hmm. The reason for it, the cases that I've seen where there hasn't been paralysis, there's not been a lot of functional overlay as well involved in the whole process and we've been labelled with fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue or, or those sort of things. And a lot of polio survivors get labelled as fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, which a lot of doctors don't believe in as well, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Big difference between the, the, those three and polio survivor. Firstly, in terms of when you look at people who end up with chronic fatigue or um, uh, fibromyalgia, is they're often driven personalities anyway, and they burn out, and it's something that happens in their life and all of a sudden the world falls apart. So they get that, they burn out. But the big difference in managing the two groups, gross generalisation, but this is what you generally find, is that chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia say, yeah, you've got to help me. I can't do it anymore, you've got to help me. Polio survivor says to you, you've got to help me help myself. And just those two extra words make a huge difference in the way you manage things. They usually are looking for ways to manage. They're not necessarily looking for cures. They're not blaming anybody else. They're not angry with it, the world. They just want to get on with life. And it has a different place. I don't know if you find that, but I, I certainly yeah, say that. Yes, yeah. That's what I'd say when you've been exposed to a computer fire. And I see both groups. The, the thing I will say about the group that has the meningitis or encephalitis, they often have a lot more fatigue, which makes a lot of sense. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's post polio syndrome, but they've got a fatigue syndrome associated with it. And interestingly, one of the things you'll find when you try to get a history from the person is that they don't know a lot about what happens, what happened at the time. Because they're often children under the age of five and their parents were embarrassed or just totally overwhelmed by the fact that they let their child get polio and they never talked to them about it because it was a traumatic event in their life. So sometimes the history is a bit sketchy, but you usually find out about um, various aspects of uh, the development that sort of fall behind and you, you can work it out. Why does it happen? Why do we get this? This process where um, they have the infection, they make a level of recovery, seem to go along all right for a while, and then the world starts falling apart. A couple of things. Firstly, I talked about them having a driven personality and creating the environment to cope. And I remember giving a talk in one system one day where I said uh, about coming to terms with what you've got, and this woman says, I've come to terms with what I've got, and all the others are going, oh yeah. Um, and I said, oh, do you have a cleaner? And she said, yeah, I've, I've learned, I know I've got all the damn there. I said, do you clean your house before the cleaner comes? She goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she still wanted to be in control of the whole situation. And you talk to some of the, 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 the sibling, I don't know, the sibling, the offspring of polio survivors would come in and you'll say to them, I suppose dinner was on the table at six o'clock every night, dishes were done by seven, you're playing structure and all this. And it was always the way, it was always organisation of the environment. So they're very good at organisation. A lot of polio survivors are very, are very powerful politically and administratively because that suits them, they, that suits their personality, so they often have significant uh, jobs. There are a number of polio survivors in the community that you would know who are actually very, very successful. But they never complain, they just get on with it. Okay, what happens? So when you have your acute infection, which is the initial polyomyelitis, it's a total body experience, for want of a better expression. So it affects the whole neuromuscular system. They start to recover 
but you don't get full recovery throughout the body, and certain areas tend to be more affected than others. And you tend to find the lower limbs more than the upper limbs, but it, it happens both. The other group that you'll often find that don't necessarily fall in the paralytic, but are, are important to the spinal group. They're a group that has spinal involvement rather than involvement, and that I do count as paralytic. So the, the motor unit remodels, and we'll, we'll do have a diagram in a second, where you have less nerves supplying the same amount of muscle. So it's like playing soccer with nine players rather than 11 players. They do their work, but they're not as efficient. But as we get a bit older and we use things, our, our ability to regenerate drops off, and then we start getting decompensation because you don't have the neural drive for the neuromuscular connections. So diagrammatically, very simple, you have this yeah. This is your motor neuron, your motor nerve. The cell body is axon, and then you've got your muscle attached to the uh, terminal axon sprouts. You have an acute infection, so you lose you lose up to fifty percent of your neurons. What happens is the body has ability to recover. It can't replace that neuron, but it gets the other nerves that remain and recovers to take over the role. But if you think about it logically. They're struggling to start with and they're doing a bigger role. And with time, you start getting some regeneration and some degeneration. So you get replacement, but it's not always at the needed rate. And after, after a while, as we mature a little bit more, degeneration comes over to regeneration. So you have even less nerves to supply the muscles. You can get, you can get hypertrophy of the muscle to try and take on the role. But one of the classic things is often in a medical situation, the person that will have their joint or limb examined once, and that's it. You actually have to repeat the uh, examination several times. Because the good example is if you lose 50% of your neuromuscular bundle in your quadriceps, it has a major ramification. When you walk, you use 30% of your quadriceps for each step, so 30%, 30%, 30%. But by that stage, the other 10% is able to work with the recovered, another recovered 30% and drops 20% from it. When you're in a polio situation, you've only got 50%, so you use 30% for the first step, and you've only got 20% left next, mm -hmm. and then you're starting to rot already fatigue neuromuscular groups. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen is fatigue starts to kick you up a lot because you're running on empty. So the classic thing they talk about is that they, they can do things for a while and they just run out of steam. And one of the, one of the classic things you'll, you'll, you'll talk to them about is how they're coping during the day. And it's always good to have their partner there because they say, oh, no, I'm doing all right, I do everything. And I say, well, what about your afternoon nap? I never used to do that. Because they have to stop. They, they have to re, reboot. And it takes a bit more. Um, so <coughs> logically, your recovery is determined by how many neurons you've got left in that recover and are able to do their normal function, how many sprouts you can throw out over the area, and how much the muscle can grow. And it's really important to understand because when I started seeing polio survivors in the early to mid 90s, we didn't do resisted exercise. We didn't think it was a role, but we know there is a role. But you really have to be gentle and you have to modify the process. So you've got to look at the whole neuro, neuromuscular parameter. So the motor, neurons, the motor unit can increase by seven or eight times. So the nerve has to supply what normally seven or eight nerves would supply. So if you put that in simple terms, if you look at your quadriceps, which is a big hungry muscle, you go from five to anywhere up to 40 pounds. And this is what I'm talking about before. Strength can appear as normal on a simple test. It's the rep repetition where you find out when the fatigue comes into the blood. So this makes exercise prescription, which I always talk about, a much more targeted, delicate approach. I've talked about the vaccines before. Um, just through salt cutting 955, saving 62. Um, now we're back to um, 
and salt because of that uh, incident. Okay, the criteria for post polio syndrome, and that was put out by the March of Dimes in 2000. Now, interestingly, you can read into anything you want to read into, and there are a number of um, children of polio survivors who decided that because they didn't have the same amount of drive as their parents, and they were feeling tired and a little bit emotional and not coping, that genetically they may have caught the polio from their parents. <laughs> it's not possible. It's not a genetic thing, it's actually a violent thing. So, when you talk about, and that group were trying to get post polio syndrome for disability and all this sort of thing, and a lot of them just needed a good quick kick up the bum and a real reality check, unfortunately. And I'll say that. I'll let him take. Um, <laughs> set the camera down for this one. Uh, okay, so the first thing, and I still stick with this, is the previous paralytic polio in my life. So you need to have some evidence of it. Um, and generally, the history of examination is enough. Sometimes you may want to go on and do um, an EMG. So that's the electromyography, where they look at the nerve conductions through the nerve and the muscle and the nerve. The issue with that is that that only shows that the person's had polio. It doesn't show that they've got post polio syndrome or whatever. Um, and I just mentioned the other group of paralytic I talk about is the spine, where they've got normal functioning limbs, but they've got severe kyphoscoliosis. So that fits my criteria as well, because there's muscle involved. Um, then you have your period of partial or complete recovery. One of the one of the common questions I ask is, how did you run? Because often people can compensate to a walking level, but then when you stretch things a bit further, and I was clumsy in sport. Yet I've had other I've had patients who played top level what was known as VFL football. They made such a good recovery, but down the track they still had some weakness or whatever, but they adapted and compensated well. Um, but you want this period of partial recovery, that can be anywhere between 10 to 50, 60 years. The normal pitch, normal pitch of people talk about is 30 to 40 years. Um, then you get a gradual onset of symptoms, particularly the fatigue, pain and weakness. Now, if you actually sit down and talk to them about what's happened, is at some point in time, things haven't gone quite right. So how do you think they managed it? They pushed harder. Yeah, they, they, they pushed harder because I don't want to fail. I want to succeed. It's really a succeed mentality. So you often have to go that far back. And there's often an incident where a fall happened or or just a minor car accident or whatever, but it's enough to tip them over. But the way they first manage it is just pushing harder. And so when you when you actually look at the strict criteria, they talk about uh, symptomatology over the previous 12 months because it often takes that 12 months to actually acknowledge that there's something's not working. So it's, um, it's something that's really important to note. And that's the year. And the other thing you have to do is exclude other causes because there are other reasons why people don't function as well, even though they've had polio in the past. And I've had patients with MS, strokes, cerebral palsy. My classic is a woman that was brought to me um, with a doting niece. She was Italian and her, her sister, who was the mother of this niece, had since passed on, brought the daughter across and was caring, the sister across and was caring for her. And she'd been labelled as polio when she was six months in Italy and nothing else happened. And she's coming and got sent to me because um, they wanted me to give an opinion about the co medical costs for looking after this woman in the long term because she had post polio syndrome. So, go to the waiting area and call her in. She gets up onto her frame and there's that lovely scissoring gait and she's got a mild dysarthria and all the rest and she was cerebral palsy. <laughs> but somewhere back in the in the hinder, someone's black and polio. And it's a real risk because individuals get labelled with polio, which the medical fraternity either wants to believe, or sorry, doesn't want to believe, or puts everything onto. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be careful. We've got a friend, a polio survivor at the moment, who's just um, had significant abdominal surgery um, that we all missed 
for, for reasons many of, but mainly because she never complained. But unfortunately, she's doing well now. Um, but everything will be linked down to the polyam. Okay, so it's an unexplained constellation of symptoms in a patient who's had thoroughly <coughs> That's the definition. And the features may include new muscle weakness, pain, and fatigue. They're the three common. And then you may get some new muscle wasting, either in limb that's affected or another limb. They struggle with, they start struggling with just their personal and domestic activities today, living access to the community life. Heat or cold intolerance. Now that's a, heat or cold intolerance is an interesting one because in, within the book they talk about that, but I can't think who's going to get heat intolerance, I can't think who's going to get cold intolerance. It's just an individual process. But it does tell us that there are smaller motor fibres involved, clearly. Um, and you've also got to be aware that they can have some swelling, breathing, and um, difficulties, and sleep disturbance. Obstructive sleep apnea does have an association, particularly within cephalic and meningitic groups. Can you talk about the reason for the pain? Um, the crop is post. Okay, no, no, it's, a good, it's a good question. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's a good question. We'll go back to that in a second. All right, the pain is usually two types, musculoskeletal or neurogenic. The musculoskeletal generally can be accounted for by the, the various forces that the joints have had to carry over the years in a, a non-ideal body. Right. So you'll, you'll often have patients oh, complaining of, yeah, like like said, or the opposite side, so yeah. the opposite yeah. hip wears out because yeah. of, yeah. so yeah. You've, you've got yeah. that group, yeah. so osteoarthritic musculoskeletal, and then you get the neuro neurogenic or the cathy pain, which can be related to the uh, degeneration of the nerves. It can also be related to just an ongoing pain profile that comes along with time where your body starts interpreting, they get a complex regional pain syndrome type of picture. So they can have a mixture of neuropathic and mechanical pain. Wow. Okay. But most of, most of the time, and this we're going to come to it shortly, most of the time it's due to. Um, Mechanical inefficiency. Well, you time. think about it, if you've yeah. got a, if you've got one less shoulder than other, all, you're also have proportional yes. effects on your back. Mm -hmm. Maybe hyposcoliosis, that you get issues with the, the intervertebral disc and facet joints, and all. Over time, it just wears out. Every time you take a step, you put three times your weight through that leg, right. through the spine. So you're transferring forces all the time. So if you've got if you've got a disproportion in terms of your leg length, then you're actually putting torsion forces through the back, which is the worst thing for it. Did I answer that? Yes, you did. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Only a small proportion of the population of polio survives. So, you know, less than 1%. Uh, Tasmania has a slightly larger proportion in closed environment. But this percentage is going to go down if you're more mature. Um, they all, half of them have post polio symptoms. But if you think about it, pain, fatigue, weakness comes along with being a parent. Because <laughs> you get tired, you get run down, you feel blah. So you, you've, got to be, you've got to be a bit sensitive to the symptoms that are described. And it's got to fit a picture. Fascinating though, the number of polio survivors who didn't realise they had polio, or just put it down to getting on with life, is, is higher than you think. And there are quite a number out there who we haven't got a record yet. And that'll be particularly in the rural and um, out of reach areas because they don't tend to focus so much on their illness because if they're ill, no one does the work for them. So you'll find that the rural community is often an area where we, we've missed a little bit. Um, so the likelihood of getting post polio syndrome is much greater if you're over the age of five and you have more severe infection. Because under the age of five, the neural, neural system is more malleable and adapt and adjust. We know. Um, but we also know, just, just on that note, don't forget, uh, we also know that the neural system can still regenerate, recover more than we ever thought. When I went through medicine, I'm going back to that. People had a stroke, that was it. Um, if they hadn't recovered after three or six months, that's, that's it. I'm seeing people recovering 20, 30 years down the track. Mm -hmm. So there's still this flexibility within the neural system for recovery. That plasticity is there. Mm -hmm. And in terms of polio survivors, 
anywhere between a quarter and three quarters will have the symptoms of post syndrome, but that doesn't mean they've got post syndrome. Because you're human, other things happen to you as well. So you've got to, you've got to really listen and look. So, when we started talking about post polio syndrome 10 or 15 years ago, that's what we talked about. But the term late effects of polio has really come into play. Because not, you'll be surprised, the proportion of patients that you do see we refer to as post polio syndrome is really quite small. It's actually often more to do with the late effects of polio. Doesn't mean they don't have, they may not progress to it, but um, this really comes into the mechanical issues that we talked about. I have to say, I still, for insurance reasons and simplicity of time to, I want to try to manage a patient at work. I'll put post polio syndrome down right the later effects of polio because it does two things. It tends to get a strain towards the neurological side of things. And secondly, um, the insurance company to understand what it is. <laughs> um, but this is usually mechanical failure. So I like to think about post polio syndrome being a little bit more neurological and late effects of polio being a little bit more mechanical orthopedic. But there is overlap, but you've got to weigh up what you're presented with. But they, they certainly present with pain fatigue and weakness, but they also have problems with weight gain that. And the other, one of the other great things in life that I get really frustrated with is polio survivors being told to lose weight when they're stuck in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Most of them eat like sparrows as it is. So that becomes a, it's a bit of an insensitive, insensitive, insensitive response. And you really need to adjust. Yeah, certainly they need to lose weight, but you need to look at the exercise and prescription. How can you get around that process? So you've got to, you've got to look at the whole individual, what they're capable of, what they're not capable of. Um, I don't want to back to so the polio survivor can, who presents new symptoms can have one of either, tends to be more the mechanical than the neurological. But with time, you may well find that you're falling more into this group because of that neuronal drop off with age. The, the, critical, the critical reason that we, we talk about this is sometimes you, you can focus on the mechanical a bit more. 20 years ago, we'd never do a, a joint replacement on polio survival for various reasons. But um, now, if any of my patients in a joint replacement, let's get it done, guys. Let's move on because the pain and disability associated with the joint replacement, if you can fix that, improves quality of life. They all should have rehabilitation afterwards, which is a challenge for talking to the surgeons to adapt and adjust. But it can make a huge difference. Because most of them have put up with the, the disability associated with the joint problem for longer than they should have. Because one, they don't want to admit to it, or two, they don't think there's anything else that can be done. Okay, so just to quickly, we. The reason why you need to make a distinction between the two is really you may well change your management plan a bit depending on what you've got. So if you know it's not a neuronal failure, then you can probably push it a bit harder. If it's a neuronal failure, you need to be a little bit more cautious because of the fatigue aspect. Remembering that mechanics go out the door when, when fatigue kicks in, so you can do more damage. Um, the etiology of post polio syndrome, we're not totally sure, but certainly we know that motor unit dysfunction can impact overuse. So what tends to happen is that the, the limbs that are, um, <coughs> that make a reasonable recovery after the initial infection, they tend to get overused to cover for the, the, the limb that isn't functional. The limb that doesn't get used has a disuse, the deconditioning process going on. Yes, we do lose motor units with aging. And there can be a combination effect of those things. What we do know is there's no, there's no clear predisposition to motor neuron degeneration or motor neuron disease. There is no immune mediated response. They've looked at growth hormone and there hasn't been any clear connection. These are all postulates. And there's no reactivation of the infection. Remembering, however, I said to you that if you've had polio, it doesn't mean you're immune because there are other strains that you may well pick up. So you should be immune to this. Crop prior symptoms, fatigue, pain and weakness. All very, very prominent in post-polio interests. 
question to go back to that previous slide. Which of those is impacted by the fact that someone's older when they first is that because they're less, less um, most of it's going to be muddy or so, dysfunction. So if there's seven rather than three or four. Yeah. Because the plasticity is there to re rebuild as well. Yeah. Good question. Because yeah. clearly yeah, something's quick. going on to cause that statistic. Yeah, and, yeah that's right. And but it more severely. Yeah. Yeah. So more severe and older, you don't have the plasticity to re, re grow the neuromuscular groups. Um, so the commonest features fatigue, pain, and weakness. The most disabling of the features is the fatigue. That's the same with all neurological conditions, though, because you can't see it. No. People can show you weakness in some respects. They can look uncomfortable, but fatigue is one of those things that just creeps up. Mm -hmm. So it's often the most um, difficult to manage, and it really is the key to your ongoing management in the long term, mm -hmm. to minimise that fatigue. Um, you may see new, new atrophy or new wasting in about a quarter of the cases. And we... And we believe that if you have true post polio syndrome, you de decline at about a rate of 2% per year. So <coughs> people just drop off a little bit with time beyond what you'd expect with ageing. One of the difficulties, of course, with older patients is they get tired and you just get old. And it's more than that. Um, so, primary symptoms, fatigue. It's usually both a combination of muscular and neural. But you don't forget that there are other causes of fatigue. For fatigue. Pain wears you out. Having to fight pain and tension, stress for all the time. If you've got an associated dis uh, respiratory disorder, these patients often have um, restrictive lung disease, which means they can't expand their chest as well, so they can't oxygenate as well. They may have obstructive sleep apnea with sleep disorders. And they get treated for with restrictive lung disease. They often be treated with ventilin and things like that. But it doesn't make a lot of difference. It's about the physical status. Fighting joint problems, you know, joint pain, arthritis. You don't walk as well. It's hard to shoulder pain. It's hard to do things. You get fed up for not being able to be as perfect as you used to be, and your ego suffers a bit, and you often see. Issues of anxiety and depression associated with not being able to cope like you used to. Remember, these guys are doers, they're not sayers, they're doers. They do the job and then people find out about it, but they've moved on to the next job. So, yes, the pain can be either due to muscles, nerve, and body mechanics and other yeah. And a lot of patients get muscle pain. The way muscles tell you that they're fatigued and tired is pain, it's spasm. So if they're overworking, that's what happens, they fatigue and they say that. And um, new weakness. So most of the time it occurs in the, the previously affected muscles. So they might have had, so you might have been able to pull your big tire and all of a sudden you can't start doing it. Or you might be able to get your ankle up a little bit, but now you've got a full foot on, those sort of things. The reason that there's such a variation in the percentage is because the studies all vary in terms of their criteria. But um, you can see in not, affect, not previously affected muscles, and what we mean by that is they seem to be normal after the, the initial infection. Um, and patients often talk about restless legs, leg cramps, oh, all those sort of things. Magnesium is very useful in this patient. Simple. So, Pulmonary dysfunction is usually related to um, res um, restrictive lung disease, but sometimes where you've got midbrain and uh, uh, um, the lower brain areas involved, but you can have some decreased drive in terms of respiratory function, so you've got to be aware of that. And that may have a significant impact upon anesthetics, for example. Uh, sleep disorders, especially destructive sleep apnea, but most people who are driven personalities don't sleep as well anyway, because they never turn their brain off. Yeah. How many of you get a full eight hours sleep at night? <laughs> you don't have children, do you? No. <laughs> 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 okay, I should stay that way. <laughs> yeah. um, dysphagia. 
Now, this may is interesting because we know that there is striated muscle in the, in the esophagus, so like normal muscle, yeah. um, not smooth muscle. So you can have significant involvement, particularly when you've had up on the involvement in the You have to watch out for that. Um, we talked about heat and cold intolerance before, so there's obviously other pathways involved. And the patients will often talk about the limits, but in fact, it's just been like an ice block all the time. But then you'll have other patients who temperature gets above 23 and just sweat into it, so it doesn't do it for person to person. Um, commonly see arthritis because of the various pressures you put on joints and muscular sweat And I've mentioned the sessions I've had to the stuff you got there. Okay, in terms of uh, evaluation, history and examination are really important. But when you do the examination, it's more than just doing a straightforward doctor's examination, it's actually looking at functional aspects, seeing so people can pick up things, twist and turn and all those sort of things. EMG, that's, we'll show a picture of that a second, that shows that you've had polio, but it doesn't show that you've got post polio I can tell you've got polio. And I love a couple of my neurological mates, they always believe what they do. In EMG, they know with my interest and they find someone with polio, I always get a referral straight away, so it's good. <laughs> and um, CK elevation, that tends to su suggest that the muscles are burning out, but it's not really good. Trip to a line never asked for it. Okay, so you want to know the age of onset for those um, prognostic features we talked about. Um, how long it was between time of your original infection and when you started to decline. And that time shorts, that latency period shorts with the more severe, um, tends to start with the more severe infection and the older onset. And there are a number of patients that I've got who had their polio in their 20s, 30s. Just unfortunate, mm -hmm. even though we think that as kids, but adults got it as well. Um, so it's more often lower limb, residual in the lower limb, but that doesn't mean it's the case. And as, as I said before, often post polio syndrome, the presentation is insidious. It's just slow. Something's happened, but things just slowly fall apart as they can't cope with it as well. Um, this is classic EMG. What tends to happen is you've got these huge motor unit amplitudes and it's long and it's unstable. So normally you'd see it all in fairly straight line but everywhere. And there's late potentials here. So these are all, all features that you see. And these late potentials are often presenting, uh, representing the nurse trying to regenerate. Um, one of the things that's really important to understand is it's not really a progression of a disease, it's a progression of ability mm. and disability. Um, and then this is a classic example of you start off 100%, you get your polio and you're basically down to non-functional and then you recover. So you get that rapid rate of recovery which is common in neurological conditions. Then you slow it down, it stabilises for a while and then things start to decline. And if you have a look at a lot of chronic neurological conditions, that's what happens. Um, so, we tend to think it's been overdiagnosed. That doesn't mean we don't accept the terminology, but we want to make sure that we've got the right diagnosis before we label people with it. Because once you label a person with post polio syndrome, you think they've got it, you're telling them they're going to decline for the rest of their life. Things are going to get harder as you go along. But, but, but it's not just the survivors themselves. Often get a bit cross with that, don't they? They 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 get a bit cross with the fact that they won't be um, given a diagnosis, but it doesn't mean that they don't have the lung effects. Whole Absolutely. Way. So the problem that a lot of the patients, a lot of your patients might find, is that you know they'll say, "Oh, I can't get a diagnosis. That's Steve. He won't give me a diagnosis of post polio syndrome." But it doesn't mean that they are not experiencing the latex yeah. mm -hmm. All right, which which is just as valid. Right, and it's just that they're not going to get a diagnosis. A lot of it, and a lot of this is well, it's not they're not getting the diagnosis that they want. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and what this is about is that sort of at the turn of the century, because I can say that everything was about post polio syndrome. <laughs> That's, <only reason. laughs> That's right. But it, it's only and as I said, we only started using this term late effects of polio in the last ten years or so. But but that's because. That was the answer to why I was falling apart. 
So I'm comfortable with that. Well, so, it's good to know a reason. It's awful to not know. Oh, absolutely. We're not saying that they don't have a reason. What we're saying to them is we don't want you to think that you're going to fall apart and continue to fall apart. We time. may have some things that we can introduce to improve your quality of life yeah. and help you adapt to the approach. <laughs> Does that mean you're underdiagnosing <laughs> Well, you know what? I actually don't suffer that diagnosis. Oh, that's good. I'd rather know what their capabilities are. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you can have the label, but I don't want to... I don't, the problem is once you give our label, that's what they fixate to. Yeah. What you're really trying to manage is how they cope on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, across the board everywhere. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the biggest problem with fibromyalgia and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I've got this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you might have that, but what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. It means what are your functional capabilities, how are you coping, what does that impact upon your life? Do you talk about your busy eye and eye? It does. It sounds like you're busy. I'm married to the speech. Apparently I don't communicate very well. But it's... Well, but that's rehab. Yeah. I should be talking about that. Yes, that is true. But it is an issue, and I think you've really highlighted the point, is it's a label. Is it a diagnosis? Yeah, I think it actually, it is a diagnosis. I think it is a diagnosis when you exclude everything else. But so is late effects of polymyelitis. That's a constellation of symptoms and signs that you're putting together to say that you've got mechanical problems that's trying to adjust. So, Sorry, do you think um, in the population of, of um, people with Post-polio um, clients who are extremely debilitated, you know, have water and sack braces and calipers for all their life, that sort of thing. Do you think a lot of them don't really care as well about that? They just want to be getting on with it and, and making the most of what's happening to them? That's a good question. I think it varies. Yeah. I think uh, and it's one of those other things that's hard to predict as well, but I, I do think it varies. Some do want to, some already know. I said to you before, at the start, they know more about this than you and I do. Some already know. My, I think most actually just want to be able to get on with things. Yeah, if I've got the diagnosis, I think you get into that category that four or five percent have become a little bit precious that they want to have a label. And, and you will. You'll get a few people who aren't happy with you not calling it post polish syndrome. But as I said, that's not what I'm really interested in. What I'm interested in is saying, how are we going to manage this? What are we going to do? Sure, you've got that label. Sure, what? But what's going to go on? So I'm going to quickly go through the management, then I'm going to hand over to Louise. But I think the critical thing you have to understand is you need to balance activity and burden. If you can look at improving strength, which we know we can do now, which we didn't think we could do, looking at endurance, and balancing that against burden, that really helps. As I've said in the past, as those who have talked before, pacing is the answer. Pacing and ergonomic setup. You've got to do it right. And occasionally when I'm getting someone who's a bit recalcitrant, I ask them what sort of toilet they have. And the reason is if they have a single toilet, they give them three posters with pacing written on it so that they can put one on the wall at the back of the door, one here and one here. And while they're sitting here thinking about the world, I try and work on the theory of osmosis. <laughs> um, and what, the other thing you have to do is look at gradually decreasing their energy expenditure. Now, as a group, being generally a little bit older, that should be happening anyway, but you just need to be a bit smarter because of the way they want to do things. You have to adapt. The other thing you have to do is work on the theory of covert dominance, which is have them thinking they're making the decision, but you're really making the decision for them. You've heard that before, you? Yeah, we <laughs> So that they, they believe that they're making the decision. But that's what you do in practice. That's what making people feel uncomfortable, making people feel comfortable with the decision. Um, uh, look at lifestyle modification, try and manage muscle capacity, tree fatigue. Orthotics are so important. But it's almost the hardest thing to get. The two hardest things to get into, orthotic and then wheelchair. And you've got to put in terms of saving energy to do things you really enjoy. Medications are generally a waste of time. Occasionally you'll have someone has success with cutting some Q10. Western Australians have a, a punch on for carnitine. I'm not seeing a lot of evidence for it, but the Western Australians like it, I'm recording. Um, <laughs> and 
These other medications, they generally have a role when there's another process going on with those medications of interval. So depression, antidepressants tend to work. Non-steroidals if there's an inflammation. Um, but once again, I do recommend using things like magnesium for cramps. Mm -hmm. And I'd always encourage people to use multivitamins and such, so that we yeah. make sure that they're done with um, You always want your muscle load to be less than your capacity. And if you've got complications, urinary tract infections, arthritis, all those things, get a treatment. She always use the term challenges, but I've got uh, problems there. And you, the whole the whole game is fatigue, weakness, all those sort of things. And there are strategies in place that can be utilised, and various individuals who can do that. So what makes up the team? Firstly, the polio survivor and their carers or family, if they've been uh, humble enough to say that they need some help work with a carer. Um, the neurology consultant, generally there to give us a diagnosis and relevant investigations, but if they've got a rehab bed, then a rehab physician's in place. This order is not necessarily of importance, it's just the way I wrote it. Physios, we're going to go through that. Occupational therapists, these are just the various roles, and you can have a copy of this talk too. And speeches for swallowing, voice production. Social workers are really important, because often they get to a point where they can't work anymore, and with a complex system of centrally now. Um, like to come in with the you know the center link out there, out there are not meant to tell you what to do unless you ask the question. Yeah. The spiritual position, I, I, I generally recommend all my patients now have a, a sleep study at some stage, even if they're not complaining of sleep disturbance or why, so you've got a baseline. Orth is really important, there are good orthotists and there are not so good orthotists everywhere. Um, it's like they're good doctors, not so good doctors. Uh, psychologists, particularly if they're struggling with being that. And I actually prefer psychologists to psychiatrists, because so good psychologists give people strategies to move forward. And that's what it's about. It's not a rebirthing experience. It's not a New York panel of psychiatrists. It's about saying it's okay to feel like this, but how are we going to move forward? Um, clearly, dietitians have a role. It works in support groups. Really important. Some support groups are better than others. Yes. <laughs> And various other things, acupunctures, you know, give it a try. Yoga, I think, is really good because it's usually not stressful and gets people out doing things. Meditation works quite well, so occasional hypnosis is useful. Um, personal trainers, but you have to be involved in the process. You have to tell them what they can do, what they can't do, because they tend to be very enthusiastic. Um, and other medical groups as well. This is a quick note on the medications. We've tried, we've looked at a whole range, and really not a lot of, not a lot of luck. One of, the, one of the commonest questions I get asked is, I'm about to have this surgery, but I'm, I don't think I should because I've got an anaesthetic. And the answer is, if you prescribe something, if it means it's life-saving or will benefit you enormously, then we try it. There are, one of the problems you tend to find in polio survivors because they're that neurological group, they often tend to be sent, more sensitive to centrally active medications. So they can really flap quickly. And they do. So I usually say if someone's booked in for a, a day procedure, I'll contact the, the surgeon or physician involved and say, maybe I'm not. Because you allow twice the time to wake up in the outside because they tend to be more sensitive. But the general rule of thumb is that if the medication has a specific purpose in ensuring that someone lives, it's probably more valuable than worrying about the side effects of the medication. We can work on that. But you do have to be careful of certain medications. So all sleepers, like the uh, benzos, like tamazepam, valium, the like, have got a real risk. Uh, barbiturates, which you don't see a lot of, but they are around. Uh, major tranquilizers. They all, tend to, they all tend to flatten the person more, so you've got to be a lot more careful with them. Um, the, the one that people often talk about are the beta blockers, because beta blockers by nature tend to dampen, and people often str struggle with them, so you, you do have to monitor those closely. And the other group is the statins, you know, for cholesterol. There seems to be a bigger sensitivity for statin myopathy, so muscle problems in the polio group, so you've got to be careful. <coughs> the problem with statins is the GPs and um, cardiologists have being in trade to say that these are really important drugs that are beyond touching. But you'll have a patient who has a stat myopathy and can't move. And I so say you can't go off that, you might die. And you think, well, hang on, you may well die from bed sores and 
chest mm -hmm. infusion thing. So you've got to be very careful with statins. And that's probably a good spot to finish. And hand over to Louise. Some more question regarding Sorry, heat and cold sensitivity. Would you recommend a normal cold for them or high cold? Um, I generally recommend trying hydrotherapy pool first. The biggest, the biggest issue with neuronal, neurological conditions in terms of hydro is fatigue. So you try it out. But often, say you're looking at doing a 30 minute session, I might only start with a 15 minute session and see how they go. I've got a couple of patients who think, God, how are they going to cope with the hydro? And they love it. And it really does help them move. Others, you think this would be really good for them and they just can't tolerate the, the heat. But as a general rule, it should be probably an MS temperature pool is probably the right, that's just that little bit cooler, but not normal pool type situation. Can I say that it's pretty? All the code in here? Do you want to get hand Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one, yeah, that's the one. Okay. Any other questions for Steve at this point? Yeah. Um, can you actually. Um, uh, request that a anaesthetist treat someone differently for a general anaesthetic. Yep, oh, yep, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and I generally say to myself, <coughs> having an anaesthetic to advise them that there's a risk that they're going to take longer to mm -hmm. wake up, and you may not be as strong, and mm -hmm. if they want to talk, they're talking. Mm -hmm. And to be to be fair, to a number of anaesthetists, they actually do it these right. days. And it, it's not a big deal. It's mm -hmm. just saying it's just going to take a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. You're a bit more sensitive to medication. They still need surgery. Thank you.